This is Duke University. It is my privilege to um, introduce Mitch. Um, so let me give you a little bit of background about Mitch. Uh, so Mitch is a proud Duke alumni. He graduated in 81. Um, and after he graduated, he went and worked at Tushin Ross. Um, and then after a few years um, over there, he went and actually worked in three different startups as CFO. And all three of them went public. And um, in 1989, he went to um, Inner South, and he's been very successful over there. He's been on the board of about 20 companies. Uh, he's actively uh, engaged on the board of seven companies right now. Um, and he's also been very involved in the entrepreneurial community. Uh, he was the chairman of uh, let me sorry the chairman of the Council of Entrepreneurial Development. And uh, he's currently an adjunct professor at Keenan Flagler. And he recently um, joined the board of CEI over here as well. So please, uh, a round of applause for Mitch. Um, so Howie turned me on. <coughs> did, you, did it work? OK. You guys hear him right? Yeah, yeah. can everybody hear me OK? Great. That's, that's terrific. Thank you. Just set the record straight. Uh, I am a Duke guy, even though I teach a little course over at Chapel Hill. So. <laughs> and, uh, and I have, uh, I'm proud to say I have two children who are Duke. One is a, um, a freshman, at, and my son is a freshman, and I have a daughter who's a junior. So I'm a big investor in Duke as well. <laughs> it's a full circle kind of thing. Um, so I, I'm here to talk to you about Venture Capital 101. and. Uh, if I can make these slides work, here we go. Apologize for the, for the colors on these. This is the last time you'll see this color because I'm going to kill my marketing director when I get back. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, so we have about an hour or so, and I'm happy to, happy to uh, answer any questions that you have about venture capital or being a parent of an undergraduate at Duke University. Anything, anything that comes to mind, I'm, I'm happy to talk about. Um, I, have, I have been in the venture capital business now for 20 years, and so I'm I'm an old guy in, in, the, in this business, and I got lots of stories. So if I run out of slides, I'll start telling stories. Um, OK, so I'm, I'm going to talk just a little bit about InterSouth, and then, and then a little bit about, uh, about the venture capital industry at 50,000 feet. And then I'd like to bring it down to, uh, to maybe 5,000 feet. How many people would be interested in being on my side of the table, kind of being in a venture capital role? Raise your hand. Show of hands. Wow, that's too many. OK, how many, people, how many people have an interest in entrepreneurship and taking money from a guy like me? Some both. That's good. That's good. The, uh, I will say that, uh, so our view on entrepreneurship is that it is, it's, the, it's the highest plane of existence. And I think as a, as a taxpayer in America, it's critically important that we do everything we can to continue the innovation that uh, takes place. And I, I won't get into political commercials, but you can ask me about the pending SEC regulation of the hedge fund industry and how that might involve venture capitalists if we have time at the end. Um, but you know, the interesting thing about the list that Adam put up is that all of the companies on the left, the big companies, they were all little companies one day. Not, not a single one of them didn't get a, you know, got started. General Motors, uh, uh, Dow, all those companies were little bitty companies that started. Now 60 years later, they're big corporations and they act like it. Google one day probably will act like that too and acts more like a big corporation today than it did 10 years ago or five years ago, but it's still uh, you know, a great entrepreneurial story. But the point is, they're all great entrepreneurial stories. And, and at some place in time, I mean, there, there are, this is my last, I'll get off this in a minute. We'll go back to venture capital. But um, it, you know, being involved in the entrepreneurship process, and we consider ourselves part of the entrepreneurship process, uh, is it, the reason I say it's the highest plane of existence is because it provides for you uh, I am completely biased, so that's okay. I'm a Duke fan too. So it, it, it provides for you the best experience you could possibly have in the sense that working in a small company 
One, you get to control your own destiny. Two, you'll see a whole lot more of the business world than you would in a big company. And three, at the end of the day, well, working for somebody else is not the best way to create net worth for yourself. And so having a little piece of the pie is a great way uh, to fund your retirement. Um, now, having said all of that, I will encourage my children and uh, all of you probably to go to work for a big company. If you haven't already done that, you probably have. Because big companies do a couple things really right. They know how to do things. And they're not making it all up. So all of our companies are making up almost everything all the time. Now, most of the people that work in our companies had experience in a bigger company at one point, And they learned about marketing. And they learned about sales. And they learned about finance. And they do a lot of training. And so you get companies like GE and IBM and others that are fantastic at training people and helping you figure out what the right way to do things. So it's not bad to go get big company experience and then bring that to, to bear in an area that you're passionate about. OK, enough about that. So InterSouth, and I'm only going to say a few things about InterSouth. We are a, what I would consider to be a classic early stage venture fund. And that, that uh, depending upon who you talk to, is a little passe these days, being an early stage uh, venture. I don't, I don't know if you've heard that over at Idea Fund Partners. But, um, and there are a lot of reasons for that, and I'll tell you about that over the next hour or so. But we, we are, um, we, early stage for us means first institutional capital. First institutional capital means that there hasn't been another investor there before we got there. That doesn't mean they haven't raised any money. It doesn't mean they're not anywhere in terms of a business plan, although I would say in about half of the cases, and this is true for the company I'm getting ready to finance tomorrow, <coughs> the company didn't exist before we got there. That is to say it was incorporated coincident with our funding. So that, you can't really be earlier than the birth of the company. So that's, that's pretty early stage. Now, we will invest a little bit later on. Sometimes there's angel capital involved, and, and we'll get involved you know, down the road a little bit. But we want to be there to help shape the management team. So we spend a lot of our time with companies interviewing people and introducing people to help create the rest of the management team that's not present. That's, that's uh, interviewing skills, which, by the way, aren't taught anywhere, are something that you'll need to, uh, to gain at some point in your life. Um, it's amazing. There are many things in venture capital, and there are the, a skill set to be a venture capitalist. Um, I, as I like to say, I think the best skill you could have to be a venture capitalist is to have a PhD in psychology, because really it's all about people. And the technology is interesting, sometimes even important, but the people are the most important thing. That won't be the last time I say that. Um, so we are focused in the southeastern United States, and the reason we're focused there is for a couple of reasons. Well, one is it's not a very competitive place from a venture capitalist perspective. Uh, and, and so we offer our limited partners a chance to invest in what we hope are the best deals in a geographic region that's underserved. And so there's this whole thing about perfect information, the flow of perfect information, and you know, competition. Theoretically, the lack of competition allows us to get in. The best deals at good prices means higher return on investment. At least that's what we're selling. And a lot of people have bought it. And it's actually worked out. So we've, we've been at it for a long time. So, um, and and uh, so the other reason is we're focused in the South. And, and we were formed here in the Research Triangle a little over 22 years ago um, is because um, well, at the time, there was hardly any venture capital around, and so, so that made a lot of sense. But, but we, we want to be focused uh, in the Southeast because venture capital is, venture capital is in particularly early stage venture capital, is a regional business. That is to say, if you're going to be what I do with our companies, you can't get on an airplane and fly three time zones to do it. You just can't do it. So now, and, and I don't really mean to be disparaging about anybody. But I'm going to be, and I apologize in advance for everything disparaging I say about anybody else. But for instance, the, the private equity guys who buy stuff, who do, they, and here's another one of pet peeves. The private equity guys usurp the term private equity. The term private equity is an asset allocation that are non-public equities. It includes leveraged buyout funds. It includes distressed debt. It includes venture capital. It includes mezzanine debt. It includes all of those things that you invest in that are by definition, private and also by definition, illiquid. But because the term leveraged buyout fund stank, they decided they would take private equity and call it private equity. So everybody thinks, so I'm part of the private equity world, but buyout funds do buyouts. They do control buyouts with leverage. And by the way, they're a systemic risk. OK, that's a separate issue. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to go there. The, uh, and, and well, the corollary to that is venture capital uh, is not a systemic risk, in case you were worried about that. There are buyout funds bigger than the entire venture capital industry. So it almost by definition can't be. Still working on the Washington thing. I'll stop on that. But the buyout funds do buyouts. That is, they borrow a lot of money. And, and 
they buy companies. They buy controlling interest in companies. And you can do that three time zones away, but you can't do what I do because you, there's a complete management team in a very profitable business that, of course, unless it's Chrysler, separate issue, but a profitable business that you know, is going to pay back the debt. That's a financial engineering exercise. That's not a innovation growth company exercise. Okay? And so we're in the business of helping entrepreneurs grow companies from the very beginning until the very end. And it's not a transaction-oriented business like investment banking is, where there's a zero-sum game on the other side of a transaction. That is, we're going to do a transaction, and there's every penny that goes this way doesn't go this way. That is to say that every penny I get, you don't. That's the investment banking world. And that's OK, because that's a necessary part of what we do as well. That's just later on. We're in the business to build companies with entrepreneurs over a long period of time. That's not, you can't do that in Israel unless you're in Israel. You can't do it in China unless you're in China and you understand the laws of China, which are not very many in, in around what we do. But, so, but there are people who do that who are on the ground in all those places, and that's great. We're, in the ground, we're on the ground in the southeast. We have about $800 million under management. Uh, that's over seven funds, and I'll tell you about how all that works. We're about 50-50 between life sciences and technology because the deal set in the southeast is about 50-50 between life science and technology. Uh, actually, the deal flow here locally in the RTP is much more robust in the life sciences. Uh, and that's a function of the research that's going on at Duke and at UNC and at the big companies. And it's also, you know, there's lots of management talent in, in those areas. So anyway, I'm, I run our technology group. And so I'm focused on technology. But as I was telling Georgiana earlier, we all talk, we all have to approve all the investments. And so I get to, I get to listen to all the life science pitches, which is, which is interesting. Um, we closed our last fund about three years ago. We started investing in September of 06. It's a $275 million fund. We'll do about 20 deals out of that fund. We've done about 14 of those deals so far. So we've got about another year's worth of capital left. That's all I'm going to say about InterSouth, unless you have a, well, no, it's not all I'm going to say about InterSouth. <laughs> See, I lied already. The, uh, so this is our life science portfolio, and it consists mostly of uh, fancy logos that don't really say anything. But uh, it, it's kind of arranged in biopharmaceuticals and medical technologies. And so everything on the right is, there's some devices in there. Um, this is actually, Aldogen is actually a stem cell deal that's technology out of Duke. That's one of the first. There's been no stem cell therapy approved by the FDA. We hope our company will be the first one. And the company in the far upper left-hand corner, there's a company called Athenix. Athenix was, uh, uh, does uh, genetically modified plants. And so they have a unique way and a platform to discover genes that then they apply to plants. And the plants become resistant to either disease or insects or Roundup, believe it or not, is the most prevalent genetic trait. And that is you put plants in the field, they grow, you spray the whole field with Roundup and everything dies with the plants. So, that, so we just sold that company actually to uh, Bayer Crop Science, which is a German company you're probably familiar with, uh, in, a, in a great transaction that if the Justice Department actually approves the transaction, we will have a distribution to our limited partners. Um, so, Lots of drug discovery, some medical devices, lots of platform things. One other example, Biolex is a company actually in Pittsburgh that's technology out of NC State that takes a little plant called Lemna. And any of you who play golf might have seen what is commonly referred to as pond scum growing on top of these ponds. But it's a little plant that happens to have a couple of unique things about it. One is it's, it's something called a monocot. And that is, it does not have any seeds. It grows by making a genetic replica of itself. Second is it grows real fast. And so by doing so, they've transformed this little plant into a protein manufacturing uh, thing. And so in Pittsburgh, there are rows and rows of glass vials with water in them and this plant floating on them that have been genetically modified to create proteins. Proteins are drugs. And some of the more, more important drugs that we have in the world today can be manufactured using this system, which is almost no cost. And they can make proteins that are hard to make. Phase three clinical trials with the product right now, and things are going really well there. So that's the life science portfolio. <coughs> Technology is a little, a little bit, I kid the life science guys, because everything in life science ultimately comes back to the body. I mean, it's, that's why it's called life science, I guess. The technology waterfront is, is vast and varied, and so there's, we do a lot of software, and so the things in the upper, hand, upper left hand side are all software related. Mostly software as a service today, although there's some enterprise software things. There's a whole raft of semiconductor technologies, uh, not the semiconductor themselves, but the semiconductor technology that helps people build semiconductors. Uh, and down on the left are software and hardware related communications. 
and then things that don't fit neatly into anything else. We do have a couple of uh, Right Hub and Mix, our consumer-facing websites that are in a variety of different businesses, but that's the technology sector Intercept. Okay, last slide on Intercept. That's everybody at Intercept in that picture, and you can see people with, uh, with well, we do have a woman, that's good, um, and so <laughs> that's important. Catherine is a, is a uh, other, there's, they're relatively homogenous other than that. That's not true. Um, so, Garhan Khan, who's sitting there on the left, is one of our life science guys. He's got an MD, PhD, MBA from Fuqua, MD, PhD from Duke. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, Bob, so we've got some young people. Uh, Dennis and I are kind of the two really old guys who've been around for more than 20 years in the south. Uh, we've got a couple of, uh, of the other younger people. So John Blushik, who's standing next to Catherine, who's the woman in the back, has a, an undergraduate engineering degree from Duke and an MBA from Kellogg and a master's in aeronautical engineering from MIT. Not sure why, but. Um, <laughs> and then um, yeah, lots of people have lots of degrees. That's not really the point. But, and we have some, we have some older folks. Uh, Phil Tracy, who is sitting here, is a former CEO of Burroughs Welcome, which is a $5 billion pharmaceutical company that's now part of GSK. And the guy behind him, Bob Bell, did the very first uh, Duke spin out, a company called Sphinx Pharmaceuticals back in the mid 80s that we financed and it went on, it was acquired by Lilly after it went public, it was very successful for us. Uh, Bob ran, went on to run research at Glaxo and, and so we have some semi-retired people who are helping us uh, in the life science world. So those are the people that make all the decisions. I should say that Catherine, since I was somewhat not disparaging by the way, she's terrific. She's part of our technology team. She actually just, she has an MBA from Fuqua. So does David Pearson, who's in the bottom right. Jimmy has an undergraduate degree upper left there from, uh, from Duke in engineering. But Catherine has a, uh, an undergraduate degree from Cambridge in the UK and then a master's at Fuqua. And then she has a degree, a master's in nanotechnology from another school in the UK. And so she's never gone to school actually in the same continent that she lives. I can't figure that out. She did the cross-continent program here at Duke, which is how I met her. Um, so very flat organization, very small organization. This is actually a pretty big organization for a venture capital fund. Um, and so uh, there aren't a lot of jobs in venture capital for that reason. They're, they're small firms. Um, and, and you know, this is by a lot the largest venture capital team in the, in the, in the Southeast for sure. Um, so I'll, take, I'll field questions later on our team. Let me, let me, let me slide off the intercept for a minute and talk to you a little bit about, about money. Um, so as I tell our CEOs, you know, once you take money, and you're actually always finding capital for your business in some form. Um, now, if it's if it's kind of equity capital, and so I'm an X Y guy too, and so on the on the X axis we've got how much money you're raising in transaction sizes, not very much to a whole lot. And then on the Y axis, risk and return. Okay, so if we go all the way up to the top upper right, uh, that would be debt, 100% debt that you would get from a bank. Now, guess what? Banks don't actually loan money if you need it at this stage. They're just not in that business. And that's good because we all have checking accounts, and when you go to get the money out of your checking account, you want it to be there. And so if they lend money to our companies, it would be an issue. Now, Square One actually does a great job of lending money to little companies like this. But when you talk to, and when you talk to a banker about what Square One does, their heads start spinning. It's really crazy. You do what? You loan? This company doesn't have any revenue. Calm down, it'll be okay. The, uh, so so bank, our companies never, I mean, they have a, a checking relationship with a bank, but they never really get money from a bank. Um, that, and it would be wise not to, for the reasons I've said. Most people start with angel capital, friends and family money, little bits of money from your neighbors and your parents and whomever. And, and that's great, that's really important money. In fact, it's not tracked, there's more angel capital invested than any other type. They're angels because they're supposed to help, a lot of times they don't. Um, but. But you know, that they're not, you're not gonna raise a whole lot of money raising angel capital. And so you move on to kind of what the idea fund folks do or what we do. So you're raising hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars. And that would be kind of early stage venture capital. And then as things go on, uh, you know, there are some firms who just do later stage things. Uh, those are things that are either have revenue or have a lot of customers or God forbid, are even profitable. And by the way, the life science companies are never profitable from the date for the most part. Certainly the pharmaceutical companies are not profitable from the first moment we invest until we <coughs> exit and that's the plan. Because it takes too long for them to get products into the market. We'll talk more about that later. But that's, so you're, you're constantly raising money and then you know one day you might go public. Now the public market 
doesn't exist today for venture capital companies for the most part. There's been some, there have been six or eight venture capital backed IPOs this year, uh, but they're not kind of what we would normally think of as, as traditional venture backed IPOs. So that way out and that, that source of financing really isn't there, which is another public policy issue we should talk about sometime. Um, but anyway, this is the, the purpose of this slide is to say that as, the, as you kind of move up and to the right, the money gets cheaper and there's more of it. And you know, down to the left, you're going to wind up giving up a piece of the action, which is our deal is you take money from us, it's going to be equity. That is, we're not, we're not going to loan money to you. And a lot of entrepreneurs come and say, well, let me borrow the money. And I say, well, you know, the bank won't let you borrow the money because you don't have any revenue and you don't have any assets. And so I can't loan you money. I mean, we're not in that business. And if you could get a loan, you should. But you, you don't want to. So you want money from me. So the deal is we give you money. And if you lose it, that's OK. But if you, get, if you go to Wachovia and you lose money, you lose your house. That's the problem. That's why you don't go to Wachovia and do that. Now, we, won't, we may not invest in your next company, but at least you'll, you won't, you'll still have a place to live. See, that's <laughs> so anyway, lots of different money. You're always raising money from the moment you start a business. And, and uh, you just, the other thing I tell the entrepreneurs is, you, know, you wouldn't come ask me for a loan for the reasons I just said. And you wouldn't go ask the bank for equity for the reasons I just said. So when you're selling your stock, it's just like selling your product. You ought to qualify the leads, right? You ought to qualify the people you're marketing to. And, it, and it's just shocking to me how people go out to raise money. And they see, there's all these different flavors of money out there. And they're just banging their head against the wall in talking to people who are never going to write a check. Uh, but there, but there's, there's always money. In fact, I met with a, met with a company today. They raised, uh, he raised money in a former startup. He made 142 presentations to raise $12 million. So you know, you got to turn over a lot of rocks. Or, I mean, that's just, that's just the way it goes. Um, OK, enough about that. So, the, the, the deal with venture capital, this is kind of how it works. So, so um, we have what we call, we are, we're investing other people's money. We're investing our limited partners' money. They're limited partners because it's a limited partnership. Um, and, and we sit in the middle of the venture capital partnership and we make it our business to know the entrepreneurs. Okay, so, so we're going to take money. We, so every few years we'll go out and we'll raise a fund create a, a new venture capital partnership, we'll invest it with the entrepreneurs, taking equity stakes exclusively, and hopefully they grow and they become profitable or they become valuable in however that's determined. And um, they're solely there for cash or for stock. We'll talk about that also. And then we return that money to our other partners. And we keep a little bit on the way by. That's, that's the way that works. But the good news, I mean, the good news, with that, or the good news for investors and alignment of interest is we only make money when our investors make money. So we get a share in the profits of the fund at the end of the day, net of any fees that we charge. Um, and and so, so the interests are, are perfectly aligned. So for instance, we raised $275 million three years ago. We had 15 investors. And those are big institutional investors. And I'll, I'll tell you who they are in a minute. So the question is, why would you invest in venture capital? Or why would you invest in any alternative asset? And so if you were a pension fund manager, you would have a variety of options uh, to invest in. So let's say you had $100 billion that you were investing. Um, you would put most of it in, in public market stocks and bonds. And some of it, the, if you ran an asset allocation model, the asset allocation model would say, you need to put, oh, 15% in this thing called alternative assets, which includes the things I described before, venture capital and private, uh, sorry, <laughs> leveraged buyout funds. Um, now, I have to say that this is kind of the wrong time to show this slide. So as you can see, last year it wasn't so good. Um, now, the good news for venture capital that it was only about half as bad as the rest of where you could have put the money in the public market. So if you look at the one-year returns, things are bad. Um, the 10-year returns for venture capital, which is kind of the place to focus, will will actually go negative by the end of this year. So that statistic's a little bit misleading, that whole 26% up there. The statistics have been pretty good for venture capital, but um, the, you know, we have not had a very good run for the last six or seven years. However, having said that, relative to the other places where you can put money, it's been a great investment. And unfortunately, all, you know, the 10-year returns on the public markets are now negative. So if you had money in the NASDAQ or the S&P 500 for the last 10 years, you haven't made money net. Um, and it, I guess the said different, uh, I, but if, if I showed you this slide for the prior 10 years until the debacle of last year, venture capital would have outperformed the public indices by a lot. 
And that's the reason people want to put money into it. Um, I will tell you this about that, that the standard deviation among public fund managers is about that big. This is a technical term, that big. <laughs> um, that is to say, you see the thing in the Wall Street Journal where they, where they throw either, they have the monkey pick them or they throw darts and, and sometimes the darts win and sometimes the guys on Wall Street win. That's because, you know, there's not much you can do in a world of perfect information. And, you know, the, the best way to lose money is to pick the five best performing mutual funds from last year because they're almost guaranteed not to be the best five performers this year. <laughs> but in the, in the world of venture capital, the standard deviation is huge. Um, that is to say, the, the upper quartile is really the only place to invest. And if you're not in with the upper quartile managers, it's going to be hard to make money in this asset class as an institutional investor. Okay, enough about that. So the, the venture capital business, uh, since, it's actually, interestingly enough, about since I've been in the business is the length of this slide. So it starts in 1988. Um, was a little bitty kind of cottage industry up through the mid-90s that had three or four or five billion dollars under management. And then two things happened. One, the internet, and related to it, the telecom boom. Uh, and the, the sum of those two things caused, I mean, believe it or not, capital follows returns. And when capital follows returns, returns go down. It's, it's not rocket science, but as you watch this over time, in 99 and 2000, the venture capital industry raised more capital. Actually, in, in 99 and 2000, they raised some order of magnitude more capital than had ever been raised in the history of venture capital. That wasn't right. It wasn't sustainable. And, you know, of course, we raised a fund in the year 2000, and we, you know, it was a, it was a lot of fun, I have to tell you. Um, <laughs> But you can see what's, what happened is the venture capital returns have been poor since, and, and there's been a lot written about the venture capital model is broken and all the venture capital funds are going out of business. There were so many venture capital funds formed in 99 and 2000. And guess what? They're 10 year deals. And a lot of them are going to go out of business this year and next because they paid fees for 10 years. So venture capitalists kind of die a slow death. But 10 years is the number. And when you stop paying fees after 10 years, you got to go find another job. And so, what has happened is the industry's kind of settled in at about a $20 billion raise, and you can see $20 billion a year or so. Not this year. Um, this year we have $8 billion raised through, through, that's the first half. It's actually only eight through three quarters. So there's a lot less money coming into the industry. I can tell you that's not great for entrepreneurs in, in the sense that there's not a whole lot of money sloshing around. It's great for the venture capital industry because returns will go up with less money involved. Any questions? About anything I've said so far? Okay, we'll keep chugging. So where do venture capitalists invest? Well, I showed you my portfolio and as a traditional early stage venture capitalist, it's mostly in those industries and, and so this is kind of the last three quarters from Q2 2008. Um, and you can see that the, because the world ended last year and it was, it was kind of an abnormal time, everybody quit investing. So that's why the numbers are down this year, but that, that, will, that will change. It will get back to some normal thing. In fact, it's already started. But um, the big cat categories are software, IT, and recently, up, up, until, uh, up until this year, anyway, you know, clean tech and energy has been a place where lots of money has gone. And then on the life sciences side, medical devices and biotechnology. So, so there's a couple of reasons for this. This is where the intellectual property is. And this is where you can kind of get a big bang for your buck. And this is where the venture capitalists have been playing. I can tell you that there's been a great move toward clean tech. Um, I think the jury's out on that because a lot of things in and around clean tech have to do with physical plant. And we're not really in the business of physical plant. Uh, we're not in the business of building a $200 million plant. That's, that's a different business. That's a utility business. That's, so we'll see. I think, I think what venture capitalists do well and what entrepreneurs do well is innovate. And I think there'll be great innovations around energy and battery technology and other things, but I don't know that we'll be in the building of plant business. So anyway, that, those, are the, those are the sectors. Back in the day, 10 years ago, there was, there was only about 8 or 10% of the money devoted to life sciences. My personal belief is that we will see unbelievable revolutionary things happen in the life sciences in the next 10 years. The, the, now, I won't even go to healthcare reform yet, but the, uh, we, we will see some incredible changes in, in all types of, of, of medical devices and in therapeutics and things, they're going to create incredible value for, for investors. Um, let's see. So I said in, in the beginning, there's, there's really only, so here's our deal. We raise money from institutional investors. 
and then we invest it. And we'll talk about return on investment in a minute, but we, you know, our investors expect their money back. So they gave us cash, we bought stock, we need to turn that stock back into cash. Um, or we need to have that stock be able to be turned into cash by our investors. Okay, so the only way to do that is to buy the stock in a private company, that company either needs to be sold to another company for stock or for cash, and so that happens frequently. So we just sold our company to buyer. They have, most big technology companies have, you know, Microsoft has $25 billion of cash in their balance sheet. So they don't do stock acquisitions anymore. Sometimes they do. But if we got Microsoft stock, that would be okay because you can sell it the next day, right? And so we would send either that stock or the cash we got from Microsoft, or in this case, Bear Crop Science, we made a big pile of cash. We're going to send that cash back to our limited partners. So, so right now, because the IPO market is in such bad shape, and there's a lot of structural reasons for that, um, and, and I, I won't get into why there aren't any IPOs, but let's just say there really aren't any IPOs to speak of. That is initial public offerings. So the other thing we can do is we can take the company public, that, and in going public, what you do is you sell some new stock to the public, and then all the stock trades. And so then we can send that stock to our other partners and they can sell it. So, but the, at the end of the day, we've got to turn the stock that we bought in a little bitty private company startup into cash so it can go back home to our investors. That's, that's the goal. And there's only two ways. You either sell it to another company or you take it public. And there's no taking it public, so you've got to sell it to another company. This is the graph of selling to other companies, mergers and acquisitions. Um, and as you can see, you know, this goes back 10 years, um, or maybe more than 10 years. There's lots of activity in the bubble. Um, and then, and so on the left is, is the total value of all the acquisitions on the left y-axis. And on the right is the number of transactions. So there's been a kind of a steady number of, you know, three to 400 companies that are bought every year. And that's not going to put a big dent in the inventory. There's a lot of companies out there. But then um, the amount that's paid for them has dropped significantly since the bubble. But actually 2007 wasn't a bad year. Um, and and year to date, those numbers will be better, but not great. And that's just a hangover from the current financial malaise that we're in. Yes, sir. What's the split that you're seeing where you sell it to a, a strategic buyer or a corporation versus, say, a, a leverage buyout fund? Well, since, since uh, the, the leverage buyout funds can't find anybody to loan them any money, and they're all playing golf, <laughs> it's, it's mostly um, strategic buyers. So what would that have been? Say, so four or five years ago, so back when all the buyout money was raised in 05 and 06, it was about 50-50, and now it's 100 zero. <coughs> well, that's not true. Actually, we have a term sheet right now for one of our companies from a financial buyer. So, but you know, the financial buyers are really, are, are buyout firms that have built a platform. You know, they buy a company and put a bunch of money in it to go buy the company. So it's kind of a, not that much of a difference. Yes? I was just going to ask, how often or how many um, companies do you return? return the stock to your LP versus LPs versus cash? And is that is it rare or is it? Well, um, yeah. could you repeat the question? Yeah, so, yeah, so how, many, how many times do we send cash home versus send stock back to our limited partners? Well, since there haven't been very many IPOs, we send most cash home. Um, back when in the, in the mid 90s and, the early, and through 2002, <coughs> it was probably a third to 40% of the, traction, of the transactions, we would send the stock back. Now, and it depends, sometimes we did a lot of deals where we got bought with stock and we sent the public stock home from the big company like Microsoft or something like that, which is a little bit different than sending the new company's stock home. Because they don't all kind of trade like Google on day one. You know, these are fragile little companies. Uh, and then there are a whole bunch of issues around sending stock home, and, and this happened a lot where what we, literally, what happens if the market closes at the end of the day, we send a fax out saying, tomorrow morning you're going to get this stock. And, and we send it to them, and they get it. And by the time they can sell it, it's gone down like you can't believe. And then it becomes an accounting issue. Well, we told you yesterday, so that's the price we're using to calculate. It's, it's a complex issue. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? I was wondering, since you're a fund, you usually run like 10 years. And uh, I mean, these technology companies, well, for, from what I understand, typically, could, I mean, you may exit short in a shorter time frame than the life science companies. So do you find you do more deals in the technology sector versus the life sciences sector? And do you do like, I guess, do you, once you exit from certain companies, do you do more during the 10 year? Um, 
I don't necessarily know that theoretically that's the case, and everyone believes that life science technology company, te te life science companies take forever. Um, the truth is that technology companies take forever too. Uh, and it, so average age to acquisition right now, eight years for all, all venture-backed companies. Average age to acquisition, IPO, 9.2 years. So that's hard to make money in a fund that's 10 years old to do that. But so, and the other, the other dynamic is, and I'll get to this in a minute, but we put the first three years, we have to identify the whole portfolio, three or four years. Actually, the five by contract is the end of the investment period. So we have to, we kind of have to call our pockets on whether we're done investing the portfolio. Now what we do do is because the life science companies take more capital, there'll be fewer of those and more technology companies, but not because they take less time, necessarily. Uh, and, and I talk about why the life science companies don't. We don't invest, there, there's lots of money that goes into life science investing before we get there, grant funds, NIH and others. And so we're not really investing at the very beginning of the cycle, we're investing when they've already been through tens of millions of dollars. Now it takes tens of millions more, but any other questions? Yes. Um, you know, earlier you had mentioned that the venture-backed IPOs are kind of non-existent right now. And also, you know, obviously the venture-backed M&A is decreasing. So how do you allocate reserves to uh, your startups um, to kind of help them weather the storm? And have you had to kill any of the companies? Yeah, it's a, so it's a real problem. It's a not only a problem for us, it's a problem for our investors who whose private equity portfolio was self-sustaining. That is, you know, they'd commit to a bunch of funds. Funds would call capital and return capital at similar rates, and then the returning of capital stopped, but the calling of capital didn't, and the portfolios are down by 40% a year ago, and they got no liquidity, and they have to sell at the bottom, and the whole endowment foundation, Duke, is it's a bad place to be. Um, but the, so the question is, how do we reserve? So we're planning on, we plan on Every identifiable round, which we usually exaggerate, plus one more. And the short metric is somewhere between three and four times the f amount of the first check. Uh, we don't, you know, we call it deep in the alphabet. You don't want to get deep in the alphabet. You do the A round, plan on a B round and a C round. If you get to F, you're in trouble. So <laughs> I've been to F. Yes. Um, if you guys cross invest between funds, so if, for example, the next fund you raise. Yeah, that's a, that is really hard. We've done it and you have to raise the bar way up because you've got two different sets of investors and the new set of investors doesn't want you using your money to prop up the old set and really, you know, is it a fair terms and conditions? Who sets the deal? We only do that if we have an identified third party that comes in and sets a price. Yes? For startups forming now, what, what's your level of optimism that if they started today, by the time they were ready to take public equity, this market would be turned around? So, there, you know, most of the bubble companies, I, I'm very high, but it's high for this reason. Most of the bubble companies were sold on, on uh, just smoke and mirrors. You know, there was no, there was no substance to many of those companies that, that got bought for gazillions of dollars. And so the reason it takes eight years to take something public or get it bought today is because the buyers and the public are only buying things that are wildly profitable and scaled. And so, frankly, it takes eight years to get there. There was a big article in the Wall Street Journal a couple weeks ago about all the companies that are in the top 100 software companies today and how long it took each of them to get to 50 million in revenue. I mean, it took, it took Microsoft eight years to get to 50 million in revenue. So, you know, how many business plans do you see where 50 million is in year three? It just doesn't happen. So in order to build these real companies, you really have to, it, it's going to take eight or nine years. And when we get there, so our plan is to build real companies. And that takes a different mindset on the part of the entrepreneur and a part of the investors. You build real companies, there'll be a market for them at the end of the day. Now, if we get lucky and the world turns and people start buying things because, because they're strategic fits and they're, you know, they want to, if the buyers come downstream, that'll be great. We'll have a higher return on investment. But our plan is to build real companies that scale to get there at the end of the day. That's a good question. Anybody else? Yes. For a lot of companies, startup companies that provide a service as opposed to a good, sometimes it gets difficult to quantify how the public will receive the, the service that's being provided. So as an investor, how do you, what, how are you, what, what are guiding principles? So I can tell you, our, so the question is uh, how are service companies viewed by us and by, by others? I, I think, so there are lots of service companies that, that get money. Our view on that is, historically, 
do this without disparaging anybody. I can't. <laughs> it, it, when, you, when you have a service company, they're in their great service companies. Quintiles is a fantastic company here locally that's just you know unbelievably successful. They trade for 1.2 times revenue. Today, 0.6 maybe, but the maximum is going to be 1.2 times revenue. And it doesn't matter whether it's 1999 or 2008, it's going to be 1 to 1.2 or 0.8 to 1.2 times revenue. And that's it. And they only scale with people because you're selling hours almost by definition. And so you have to have, for a little bitty company, now all of a sudden in order to scale revenue, you've got to scale people. To scale people, you've got to scale capital. Not always because you have customers, hopefully. And if you're in a service business, you hire a bunch of people and then you've got to fire a bunch of people if the thing turns. So they're not worth very much at the end of the day and they're really hard to scale. And so we don't do it. And if you look at those categories up there, most venture capitalists don't do it. In fact, when we get into a software company, the very first thing I want to know is, what's the service component here? Because I'm going to look at the balance sheet. I mean, if you look at the income statement of some of these wildly profitable companies, they don't have big service components because the margin on services is 30%. Margin on software, 85%. So that's why we want to stay away from services. The other thing is, there's not really intellectual property in a service business. Right? You're competing against the next company that can raise the capital and hire the people. The only differentiator is the people. So, so for that reason, we don't, we don't do them. Okay. The, uh, so there are no venture-backed IPOs. I'll tell you why in a minute. But here's a secret. There's, a, there's, a, there's actually a great report out that Grant Thornton put out, not to, not to uh, credit an accounting firm, but it's called Why Are IPOs in the ICU? And one of, the, one of the biggest reasons is, and they go through a, about a 10-year history of why IPOs are in the ICU, and frankly, it has nothing to do with Sarbanes-Oxley, which is kind of a red herring, that, which is the thing that, in response to Enron, the regulation that came to pass, which causes it to be very expensive to be public and liability-laden and all those things. Decimalization. So back in the day, back 10 years ago, uh, in the, when IPOs were started, stocks were traded in eights. An eight is 12 and a half cents, sometimes two eights. Um, and, and so the people that made a market in the stock made 12 and a half cents every time they traded a share. When, they, when, when online um, brokerage came to be and in an effort to lower the cost for consumers, they changed the rule and said, we're going to do it to, uh, you know, pennies. We're going to decimalize trading in stocks. It took all the money out of trading stocks, so they'll stop trading. And so there's nobody to actually trade these little stocks that they would take public, so they stopped taking them public. Great report, Grant Thornton, why are IPOs in the ICU? That has a lot of interesting things. So um, I'm going to skip that one. So this, this is just, just in terms of, of being in our business. I, I will say that we are, so it's a limited partnership. We are the general partners in the limited partnership. It's actually an, LL, it's a, an LLC. But this is a limited partnership, and our investors are, it's a blind closed pool. It's blind because they don't have any say in what we do. They just don't invest in our next fund, and it doesn't work out. It's closed because we go ahead and close it, and they're committed to put the capital in. We draw it over time. Um, and so it's, it's a blind closed pool in that way. And pension funds, by the way, provide about 50% of the capital to the industry, maybe a little bit more. So um, now, this gets back to the, the question about uh, how long it takes to put money to work. It takes about three or four years, depending upon whether there's lots of deal flow or not so much. We've been on three-year cycles. So when you identify the portfolio and you do all that reserving, you start a new fund. And so now you're working two funds, and then you know, another three or four years goes by, and then you start a new fund. So at any given time, we have four or five funds. And because things take eight or nine years sometimes to work out, most funds stay open 14 years, 14 or 15 years. Yes? So if you were to line up on that scale, when do you start investing in firms based on your funding cycle? The very first day. First and in fact, while we're raising a fund, we're, we're sometimes, we're often working on term sheets and getting things ready so that the moment we close, we can go ahead and put the money to work. Um, you know, theoretically, if it's an eight-year period, the sooner you get it out, the sooner it comes back. So right. now we're, we're doing all we can not to have eight-year investments because they don't, they don't work out. So, you know, this gets to return on investment. So the great deals need to support the ones that don't work out plus the fees that, that are associated and the expenses, the audits and other things, and um, our carried interest, which is 20% of the profits. All of that needs to add up to something that is better at least by 5% than what they could otherwise do with the money that's completely liquid. And by the way, it's mostly an illiquidity premium. It's not so much a risk premium that they're looking for in an investment in venture capital. You know, 
It takes, it's a very, it's a very labor intensive asset class to put money to work if you're an institutional investor. You, we, we could all put a half a billion dollars to work tomorrow by noon if we had it in the public markets. But it would take a long time to put a half a billion dollars to work in venture capital. And a lot of people, a lot of due diligence, a lot of meetings. It's just the nature of the beast. So, the, the, uh, so the, if to use a baseball analogy, um, if, if you had a, a hundred million dollars, say, and you made 10 investments in each of 10 companies, they might kind of turn out like this, where you'd have, if you made 10 times your money, we'll call that a home run. Uh, you'll have a couple of extra base hits where you get two or three times your money or five times your money, and then you'll have some, uh, you know, where you get some of your money back, and then you got a class up there, second from the bottom, called the living dead. And the living dead is a, is a place where great company, few million dollars in revenue, profitable, can't take it public, nobody wants to buy it, can't get your money out, that's a zero, right? There's no difference in that than chapter seven. Same experience for our investors, which is we can't get liquidity. So we're focused on liquidity before we start. Now, the question is, if you, if you did this and it turned out this way, and, you, and so you have, this all adds up to $300 million. So you have $300 million, we got fees and expenses that, that run for the life of 10 years, and you've got a carried interest that would go to the venture capitalists. And so this, this would be about a $235 million returning on a $100 million investment. The question is, is that good or bad? And the answer is, you don't know until Einstein figured this out, which is time equals money. You can see the little dollar sign there in the bottom right. And, and, the, and the, the problem I didn't give you, the variable I didn't give you was time. And so I used to carry this around in my pocket. Um, so it, it, here we have, on the x-axis, we have that how long it takes to get out in years. And on the y-axis, we have the multiple x of your investment. And so if I gave you a dollar now and you gave me $5 back, in five years, that would be 38%, that number right in the middle of the chart in, in white. Um, and so the question is, if you, go back to the, if you go back here, how do the individual deals need to turn out so that the whole fund turns out in, in a place where our investors are happy? And, and the answer to that I'm saying is greater than 40% on an individual deal basis. And so everything in yellow is greater than 40%. So if you make 100 times your money, you don't have to do any math, that's a good deal. It, it just is. And, but, but you can see, again, in a, in a period, in, a, in a, an environment where it's going to take six, seven, eight, nine years to get out, in order to make 40% compounded annually on that dollar that goes in in the first year, you got to have a pretty big X on it. And, and so there, it's time, time to the end point that has caused venture capital returns to come down. The good news is the other returns are down as well. So any questions on return on investment? So you know, if you come to me and say, well, I will guarantee you two times your money in three years. I'm so two things about that. One, you can't guarantee me anything because we don't know. We're making it up and so are you. But, and, and, and two, I'm not in a two times my money business because as my investors say, we, so there's two ways to look at this. My investors say we pay, a pension fund investor says, we pay benefits in dollars. We don't pay benefits in percentages. Um, I say, okay, but I got to have the percentage too. So, so we can't be in a two times our money game. We can't do, even though two times our money in one year is, is, is a great return on investment, we can't do that. Can't do that. So anyway, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that because there's one other thing I want to tell you about. I, I, I will just say that well, what I'll say about this is this is the individual investment on a, on a, so a $1.7 million check was written and then we sold the company and did a distribution of almost $15 million 11 months later. Um, and that return is the net present value of that series of cash flows, which if in that particular case, this is one of my deals, of course, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, was good. This is the whole fund from the, so from our limited partners, they give us money and they get money back. And so here's how we drew capital. This is our 98 fund. We drew capital like this. So at this period in time, we had drawn about 60 million bucks and we had returned, including the value of the fund, this much. And so this is the stream of cash flow they saw with this number, which is the valuation date going back to them theoretically in this model. And so that had, at that point in time, that had a 77% of return. That's a little different calculation, this IRR calculation. This is how we are graded. And that's why time is our enemy. 
time is a, a real punishing thing. So uh, yes, question back there. So the general fee structure to the LPs is 20% of profits, and then is there a fixed there, There's a fee. So the general thing is 2 and 20. So 2% of committed okay. capital. Yep. Uh, bigger funds, less. <laughs> little funds, more. But that, that fee gets recovered in the 20%. Okay, so that, that expense is netted out. So it's 20% of the net economics over time. Got it. Thank you. Yes? Is that 20% of each the profit of each deal? So if one deal does really well, you take 20% of that? And if one deal, or is yeah, it? So, so it's a portfolio, and the question is, when do you get paid? So now most, most funds have a deal where you've got to return all the capital before you can start taking your 20%. That's common. Otherwise, you got to, you know, we do this first deal, and I get paid, and then we lose money, and then I got to give you money back, and that's a clawback, and nobody wants to go there. That's bad, bad, bad. Because I got to send some money to the IRS, and I don't have that money, and it's really bad. Was there another question? Yes? Um, what percentage equity do you usually take for, or on average, for deals? So hang on to that question, because I'm going to answer it in a minute, in, in one second. We're, all, we're almost done. That's my most important slide. So. Uh, so I shouldn't tell you this, but the secret of early stage venture capital is to buy low and sell high. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. Uh, but we're, you know, we're buying at very early stage values, very low values, because they're by definition early stage. And we're selling, hopefully, you know, things that, are, that have lots of intellectual property and high margins and not service businesses. And, and so hopefully we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do well. Now, I didn't talk about what we do, what my day job is for the seven projects I'm on. I did mention we do a lot of recruiting. I spend a lot of time working with our existing portfolio companies. I spend about a third of my time. I also have firm management responsibility, but I spend only about a third of my time looking at new things, probably 40% of my time or half my time working with the seven portfolio companies that I'm on the boards of, financings, uh, strategy, recruiting, crises, can't do payroll, need a new CEO. Every possible outcome has, has happened over the years. And so, like, like I say, most of our time is spent with the existing portfolio. Um, so this is how you get a meeting with me. You call Linda and she says, no, Thursday's out. How about never? Um, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. So how long does it take to, to from hi, I'm Mitch, to cha-ching, there's money in the bank? It depends. Um, the, so there's a process that we go through, which I won't bore you with. But suffice it to say, there's a bunch of meetings and some lawyers. Uh, and the lawyers almost always take 30 days at the end. This process can range. And, and frequently what will happen is we'll meet and, and we'll say, no, go bring me a witch's broom and come back. Um, and they go get the broom and they come back and we say, no. And, and then they come back and we say, you know what, now it's right. And so that, that happens relatively frequently where it comes back and back and back. We have a deal we're getting ready to do next month, I hope, that we looked at four years ago. We passed on it at least three times. But there are elements of it that are right now. Um, so it can, be, it can be 90 days to two years or four years. So this is back to the question on how much do we take. Um, and I'll, I will stop after this slide. No, I got one more after this. The, uh, so the question is, how much do I get for whatever money I give you in terms of percentage ownership? Remember, I'm only taking an equity stake. And the answer is here. There's only two variables. It's very simple. And it happens every time you take money, whether you take money from the public or you take money from your dentist, which you should never do because you always have to go to the dentist. <laughs> and you might lose their money, and then, then you have a difficult situation. Um, so, so there's a couple of that. There's this thing, well, there's how much money you need, right? And I would call that cash invested. Um, and then there's this thing called the negotiated pre-money value, the value of the company the minute before I write a check. And so let's say you had this great idea for a software company and you needed a million bucks. And we met and we said, OK. And we agreed, and we'll forget about how we agreed it. I'll tell you about that on the last slide. But we agree that your company is worth $3 million. Now, we just made that number up. But that is, we're agreeing that, we agree on that. And by the way, that is the number one negotiated term because it determines who gets what, in, uh, among other things, uh, in, the, in any venture capital agreement. So we agree your company's worth three. And we agree that my million is worth a million. I've argued about that, by the way. How much is a million dollars worth? It's exactly a million dollars. But some people see it differently. Anyway, my one and your three is four. I put up one of the four. Therefore, I get 25%. It's no more difficult than that. It's really, really simple. Now you say, 
I don't want to give up 25%. I want to give up 10%. And I would say, well, that's interesting, but now you've just valued your company at $9 million. And because when I put my one in and you're nine, that's 10, I own 10%, I can't do that deal because your company's not worth $9 million. It's just you and a business plan and your dog. And that's not worth <laughs> 9 million bucks. So, and, and it's kind of interesting. So to the, to the point of how much do we want? I, I, so I want enough to get control. Not, uh, so I do not want control. I do not care about control. I want a meaningful ownership so I can have a board seat. I want a meaningful ownership so I have a voice. But I'm mostly concerned that that $4 million post money in that example, the next time we go to raise money is worth more than $4 million. bucks. That's all I care about. I'm, I'm in business for return on investment. That's my goal. And together, we all own stock. The stock's going to go up in value. You're going to have options. You have founder stock. I'm going to buy stock. We're going to work on the stock going up, which, by the way, might include you not being CEO. Separate conversation, though. We're talking about valuation. The, uh, but, but all I care, so I don't really care if I have 19% or 54%, doesn't matter to me. I'm not hung up on that because I also have an attorney and, and in the preferred stock agreement, I'm going to get all the things that I need to do to carry out my fiduciary responsibility. You're not going to be able to sell the company or raise more money or do certain things without me saying that's okay. I can't make anything happen. I can prevent things from happening. So that's why I don't really care about percentage ownership other than I want to have a meaningful state. Oh, and by the way, I can't just write a $1 million check. I have to put more money to work because I can't divide $275 million by one or I have 275 projects. And there's only 12 of us. We can't do 275 projects. So there's, there's a few other things that I need to push around. But at the end of the day, I really, I really only care that we have a fair value. And by the way, after we, so now we have a million dollars to spend. I'm worried about when we're done spending that million dollars, what's the company going to be worth? That's all, that's really what I care about. Because together we're going to go raise money and now my chair is on your side of the table and I'm going to help you raise money. It's going to go like this. This is an example of a company. So in the first round, you know, there was a pre-money value of two. You maybe you did an angel round, took a half million dollar in. And so now it's worth two and a half. And we go to raise money the next time, it's worth four. That's good. So we get a markup. We're going to take the dilutive effect of raising $4 million. And so this new $4 million that goes in the next round gets 50% of the company, but it's at a higher value. And so, the, so at the end of the day, if we can keep increasing the value, the founder's stake in the company continues to go down, but the value continues to go up substantially. Um, so that's kind of how that whole thing works. Any questions on that? Yes. Just a quick question. Um, obviously, right now, it's a buyer's market. So how much, in general, how much of a discount have you uh, seen in uh, pre-money valuation? You know, it, it gives, I, I, <laughs> it's not fair. A lot of venture capitalists take advantage of entrepreneurs because they can. Of course, they get taken advantage of when it goes the other way. And, and at the end of the day, we're investing in the entrepreneur. And to, for them not to have a vested interest in the outcome because you've you know, taken them down so much on valuation, it's just stupid. Um, and a lot of venture capitalists don't see it that way. The other thing is, as I mentioned earlier, it's a very long-term relationship. And so you have to feel on the other side of, of, of this negotiation, as I said, the difference between venture capital and investment banking, this is the beginning of a, God forbid, 10-year relationship. And so, <laughs> You know, you can't have a nasty taste in your mouth after this. And so it's, right now, it's, it's substantial. It's very, very, very difficult to raise money for an early stage company. Nearly impossible for a pre revenue company to get finance at all. Forget about the valuation. So the discount is high. Okay, I'm going to do, this is the last slide. The, uh, so the question is, what are we looking for? And we're, we're, I've got kind of what I'm calling the risk pyramid here because we view ourselves as risk mitigators, if you will. And those are the risks in that upside down pyramid, and they're in order of importance. Uh, and, and so, as I mentioned at the beginning, the most important thing in any deal is the management team. It's not always present at the very beginning. There needs to be an entrepreneur present in our view. Um, and, and so, we spend a lot of time on management, a lot of time on due diligence in management. Uh, the next most important thing is the size of the market and how you're going to get there and is it growing. And remember, this is a risk we take because a lot of these markets don't exist before we write a check. Uh, and so we have to do a lot of work around that. Then the next thing we have some control over are the financial aspects of the deal. What's the valuation? How much money is it going to take? What might it be worth at the end? Who else might invest? I mean, all those questions we have some control over. 
Uh, and then the fourth on the list, ironically, particularly when you talk to technical entrepreneurs who are so focused on the science, to find out that what they have spent their life working on is kind of fourth on my list of things that are important is sometimes upsetting, but it's, it's important, it's just fourth. And so we're focused on what's the strength of the IP estate, how protectable is it, what's, what's, what are competitors doing, those kinds of things. And then today, you know, interestingly, the economy has killed a number of venture deals because certain segments of the economy stop buying things. Um, most venture capital deals are so kind of cutting edge, most of the R&D doesn't dry up. Uh, and so we're generally not affected by the economy, but sometimes we were, and certainly were last month. And then every, all the three-letter agencies at the federal government, from the FDA to the SEC to the whatever they are, you know, the FDA is a, is a big problem. I mean, it's an opportunity and a problem at the same time, but you've got to be able to figure out how you're going to negotiate that. So we kind of look at that, and like, like I say over there, what we're looking for is the same reason companies fail, but it all has to do with management headed toward big markets. Last question. Yes. Uh, what's the smallest amount of money that you would put into a project? Uh, for well, to that's a good question. So I said I can't divide 275 by one. So for inner south, that's that's our, our issue. Um, I'll write a $500,000 check. I just need to know that at the end of the day, some eight years from now, I'm going to have invested six, seven, eight, nine, ten million dollars as a group, kind of one of a number of investors, and so. It does, it does, there's a whole thing about the venture capital model being broken and, and there are lots of companies that don't need that much money and shouldn't take it. Uh, and, but, so we'll start small as long as we can get to some meaningful amount. That's it, I'm gonna stop right there. Thank you guys. Thanks a lot.